Good morning, everyone. How was the party yesterday? Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. So thank you for coming here, even though you were at the party yesterday. I realize you may be hungover or not. I realize it is tough to get up in the morning, but uh, we did everything to make this talk very worthwhile for you. So we hope that we brought you some really good content that you can then use to build your own Internet of Things. And Internet of Things become more exciting as they move. So we thought we'll put, put together a session for you on connecting devices in motion to the cloud. So welcome to this session on From Drones to Cars. My name is Konstantin Gonzalez. I'm a solutions architect with the AWS Germany team. And a lot of my German engineering customers like to put things into the cloud. And uh, Germans also like moving things, as you have noticed in the keynote yesterday. And um, this talk is a group effort. A lot of people contributed to this, to this talk. We have Daniel, uh, Danny and Mark from Monsanto here. We have Ricardo here who put together a demo. And this is going to be a sandwich talk for you. So we will start this talk with a demo. We will give you some meat on the subject. And then we will end this talk with a demo. So if you find myself boring, that's fine. Just sit through it. And then at the end, there will be a cool demo. Um, I actually borrowed some LED matrixes from Zed yesterday. I think he's still looking for me. And uh, brought them with me here. And uh, hopefully, this will all work in the end. So let's start. So what, are you, what should you expect from this session? Well, we would like to point out what the challenges are as you put things in motion. And then if you want to interact with those things over the internet. We are going to take a look at some architecture building blocks that you can use for your own Internet of Things moving architecture. We'll check out some architecture patterns on how to plug this together. We'll check out some examples. There's going to be demos. And uh, we hope that this will give you some practical experience and guidelines that you can apply to your own projects. So with that, let's start with our guest customer here, Monsanto. So please welcome Mark Sparks from Monsanto. Thanks, Constantine, and uh, thanks everyone for uh, coming. Uh, as Constantine mentioned, kind of might have been a challenge this morning. I actually thought we might have been okay since this is the 10:15 session, but then I realized people at the nine o'clock session didn't go to the party. You guys went to the party, so <laughs> you guys might be in a little worse shape. Um, no, but Zed was great. Um, you know, he when he started playing Legend of Zelda, it was pretty awesome, right? So uh, I couldn't put a Zelda icon on here because the slides were finalized, but I probably should have done that. No, what a great time to be able to talk to you guys about IoT at Monsanto and in agriculture, especially, especially this year. I mean, we actually got to see agriculture come to the center stage at the keynote yesterday. Um, you guys got to hear from John Deere, and you even heard a company like Intel talk about the global food crisis and how we have to double production of food by 2050. So you see this awesome fusion of agriculture and technology, and there's never been a better time to talk about IoT. We've been doing it for a while. We've been talking about IoT, but there's awesome opportunities in IoT and agriculture. Everything from planting um, to in-season monitoring and harvest has enormous impact on food production. So we're starting to learn more things about if we plant better, we can actually protect our food better. And it means that farmers can uh, make more money, they can have better lives, and it means that we can also feed people that normally cannot be fed. So IoT is prevalent in agriculture. We're an equipment-based industry, so we just naturally have things. Farmers have a lot of things, and we want to connect those. But why is it important to Monsanto? Well, we've made some commitments to um, help the global food crisis. In fact, Monsanto's made a commitment to double the yield of our core products by 2030. And we want to do it with using one third less inputs. So less water, less soil, less ground space, less fertilizer. In order to do that, we're going to have to improve agronomic practices. So what we've done is we've built an IoT platform that helps us connect our equipment to the internet so our researchers can make decisions real time. But in order to do that, you really have some challenges that, that you face. You know, we test products all around the world, so we know farmers all around the world, and we deal with connectivity issues all around the world. Um, so really what we need to do is we need to, we need to be able to transfer data reliably, even whenever we can't guarantee a reliable connection. So how do you do that? 
I wanted to boil it down simply to three things. This is really the three things that you gotta do with an IoT platform in order to transfer data reliably. First of all, you have to have to be able to store and forward on your edge. So on your edge devices, they have to have the capability to st save their own data while they're not connected, and then send it later when they become connected. You just cannot afford to lose data in unconnected areas. You also need to have a, a low overhead communication protocol. Um, uh, Constantino will talk a little bit about MQTT later and some of the benefits, but basically battery life in low power states is important, and also just having not a lot of overhead like HTTP has during uh, data transfer. And you also, the third thing you need is broker-based processing in the cloud. So if you're, if you're running an IoT system, you're sending data in unreliable networks, you're hoping to just trickle data across, you can't be point to point. You cannot rely on just a standard API to hopefully save the data to directly to your database and, and, and be successful. If you do that, you're gonna have to do a lot of retry logic, either on the cloud or on the device, et cetera. You move to a broker-based solution where that's the broker's job. He lets you know when he gets the message and he's guaranteed he's gonna keep it until he can deliver it to the backend system. So these are really the three things you need to do for IoT. Um, this is our platform um, at a platform view. So you can see uh, everybody was excited about the AWS IoT platform. A lot of similarities as far as, as uh, uh, how we went approach the IoT platform. In fact, we were part of the icebreakers program for the AWS IoT platform. We were able to give a lot of feedback and we're gonna be using it going forward too as part of their beta program. But you know, things like communication, MQTT and HTTP at the edge, data ingestion, using, we use Rabbit as our broker. We have Cassandra cluster to distribute worldwide. We have a solar index so we can automatically index every single data point that comes in and search across it. We do analytics using both Spark and Hadoop. And we also have a cloud code module which allows our business partners to run code directly in our platform as data comes in. So they can actually deploy code modules to our platform to run as data comes in. Um, when we started this platform, we also knew partnerships were gonna be important. So Amazon obviously was a partner, but we also started, we went out to industry and built a lot of partnerships too with people like AT&T, um, CNH, Oxbow, et cetera. So it's a comprehensive platform. We're excited to be uh, part of the AWS IoT, plat the IoT beta program. And uh, we're gonna actually show you live right now what our platform looks like for a harvest. I'm gonna turn it over to Danny Williams. All right. Um, we're gonna do something pretty gutsy. We're gonna demo in production today. So um, if you've ever done that, it's, it's tough. So, uh, you know, I was good this week. I got in bed early. I didn't gamble. So hopefully the demo gods are, are nice. Um, so what you see here is, is our IoT um, application. This is the harvest view. So how we think IoT is we ingest a lot of data, right? Um, we went through many phases of this. Um, you ingest it all and then figure out what you're doing, gonna do with it later, right? So this is the harvest side. We roll up a lot of numbers. Um, for all the Twitter fans out here, our um, combines actually give us a feed of what's actually going on. So we know when they're on battery power, when they're on the trailer moving across the, the world. We know when the engine's on, when they start a harvest session, and when they end. So you see that here through the feed. Um, if you want to filter out messages, you can just see things like, I'm starting a harvest in this field. Um, to get kind of a, a, the scope of how large it really is, um, this is the globe. The green dots are, are fields or like locations. So you can see, kind of as I pan here, how we do, you know, from, from Canada all the way to, to Vietnam back to Africa. Um, so the other thing we do is you also want, you know, the kind of the operator side or, or the engineer side of what's going on. So this is the actual device feed. Um, you can see what code is deployed to that device. We, we deploy code automatically. Every time that device wakes up, it says, do I need to upgrade myself? And if it does, we push it. Um, you can see IP addresses. Um, you can see where it is in the world and when it reported in last time. Um, 
Anyone familiar with agriculture? Grow up on a farm, farm, good. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna see, is we're gonna actually see what's happening. Um, so, like I said, we are demoing production. So we're trying to show you the store and forward capability, but we're kind of dependent on what's going on in the field. So we did shut this guy down earlier, but unfortunately he turned the engine off. So we cannot get back into the box and turn it back on. So that's okay. We still have moving combines. So you see these guys moving through the field. Now this is research. So the little, the little um, rectangles you see, those are all a field within a field. So those are different products being tested against each other around the world. You'll see and, and tested in a repetitive manner. So as these move, you'll see these fill in and constantly giving us trait data, which is basically around yield. So moisture, weight of the, weight of the kernels. Um, let's do one more thing here. Let's, let's get a, let's get crazy. Let's see if we, he'll come up. Come on network, don't fail me. Okay. It's not gonna be nice. Either way, so um, one thing I was going to show you is the combine actually, its route through the world. Um, but, you know, there, you, Mark kind of mentioned it. There's different phases of IoT, right? Collect all the data, figure out what, we, what you do with it next, right? So a couple things we do on the back end, other applications take advantage of the IoT data, is do specific routing of combines, so routing optimization. So throughout the year, we're constantly moving these things, right? So they use, the system that does that uses our route information to make sure that combine gets to the most optimal field next. Um, other thing, let's go back here. Um, we do two-way also. So at some point, um, you know, you get some data that really isn't worth testing on. Um, our system can automatically deactivate that um, for that operator. And he'll have a, you know, there's a screen running in the combine, it'll tell him, hey, data's no good, keep moving. Um, so that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, I know it's a quick demo, so anyone wants to, wants to hear more, we'll be around after. But we'll turn it back over to Constantine. Yeah, so, um... You know, we, we talked about our IoT platform a little bit. This is just a picture of the infrastructure. So now you're seeing like a data, a data flow view of what Danny just showed. And I know there's a lot, a lot going on here, um, but you can kind of break it into three kind of areas. The kind of the top portion is really our data ingestion portion. And then the bottom, the bottom left and the bottom right are two kind of platforms built on top of it. You got to see the one on the bottom left today. Danny just showed it to you. Uh, what he showed you is, a, is just one example of an application that uses this IoT data that comes in. So we have it very split out so that we can separate our IoT data from the applications that use it. And Danny mentioned some of the other flows. Another one that we didn't show today is our imagery platform. So imagery is really popular now in agriculture. So we can actually take images into our platform, run analytics on them, and turn them, in, turn them into actionable data. Um, so uh, pretty cool usage there as well. Um, you know, we can go in a lot of depth on all this, and I'd love to with you guys, but um, so find us after the session if you want to ask any questions. I'm going to turn it back over to Constantine. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. So, devices in motion. Devices in motion. So, this was a great example on the value that you can get out of your devices in the field, even though they're in motion, or maybe because they are in motion. And uh, there are so many other use cases that, that you can apply this principle to. Automatic harvesting is what we saw now. Automated transport. Think of drones delivering packages, that sort of thing. Connected cars, like uh, BMW showed yesterday. Imagine all those cars in the road 
and being able to know when they switched on their windshield wipers so that you get real-time weather data or, or imagine to being able to know what signs there are on the road to, to update the maps as BMW does and all that's the, 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 the things. Of course, we can extend this to aviation and uh, there are some creative companies using moving IoT technology for sports, gaming and leisure. Um, of course, there are great applications for medical and public service. And I know some customers who are using this for tourism to make sure that they can give the right um, offers to, the, to their tourism customers as they go around some resource and, and that sort of thing. So lots of opportunity here. And the technical characteristics here are that all of these devices have to be somehow connected to some mobile networks. And those mobile networks don't necessarily all speak LTE all the time all over the place. So we need to be prepared for kilobits per second in performance. So we need to be smart about using limited bandwidth here. And those devices often also need to be very lightweight with not a lot of RAM, not a lot of CPU, and operating at very low power. And uh, because if you, if you want to put something um, on a drone, for instance, it, it shouldn't weigh that much. And that means that every gram can count every watt of, of battery usage counts here. But nevertheless, those applications can have real-time uh, things. So these, these, these decisions can, be, can happen in real time. We're going to look at a, an example from automotive where you really want to know very, very quickly when a car crashes so that you can react to it. And with, such, with, with these applications, they can, be, they can have a pretty large impact. So you want to make sure that they are really reliable and secure and don't, don't really break on you a lot. So just to give you an example here, we, we are talking about just yeah, mobile phone kind of bandwidth, not a lot of bandwidth per device, but if you multiply that with a million devices, the data adds up very quickly. So our customer Dash here, for instance, they uh, operate a, a mobile phone application that connects your phone to the car, and they collect a terabyte of data, of real-time data per day. And uh, as they feed their data through their system, this produces billions of records using Amazon DynamoDB, and uh, they see thousands of updates per second in terms of updates. So don't, don't underestimate the power of a small device if you multiply it with a million devices. So these are the challenges that we identified out of moving Internet of Things applications. First of all, how do you handle constrained resources on the device side? How do you manage millions of things worldwide? How do you communicate with them securely so that nobody can tamper with your things because they should stay your things? How can you deal with unreliable connections? What if a car goes through a tunnel? What if the harvester loses power for, a, for some time and then wants to update itself? And then, of course, as your devices start moving a lot, you probably want to handle some geolocation information. And if you want to be more sophisticated there, you need to understand mapping data and understand routing, uh, like in the Monsanto case. So let's tackle these challenges one by one. Let's start with the constraint resources bit. And as Mark pointed out, MQTT is quickly becoming a very popular protocol for connecting devices to the cloud. And the reason is simply it's much more lightweight than HTTPS. Here are some numbers. So it gives you a 39% faster throughput, but that's probably not the point. The point is here, it gives you 8x less network overhead. So you can get by with a lot less power, a lot less CPU and, and, and device time and, and resources to send a message into the cloud. And that's what makes MQTT so attractive. You can use a really lightweight publication subscription-based model to talk to your devices and not spend a lot of battery and power and bandwidth and other scarce resources here. So if you build your own architecture, take a look at MQTT as, as one of the protocols here. It's really easy to implement on your device. I just wrote a small Python script for my Raspberry Pi. It will probably be really easy to work on your device as well. So check it out. The other thing is, OK, now we have devices. We know how to talk to them efficiently. How do we handle millions of them? And this is why we sat down and listened to our customers and took their requirements and put together the AWS IoT service. I'm not going to go into much detail here. There are going to be a lot more sessions that you can visit with all the nitty gritty details. But the thing to keep in mind here, AWS IoT is a service that makes it easy for you to connect, to securely connect millions of devices to the cloud. It is a multi-protocol message gateway that supports MQTT and HTTP. So you have, of course, the choice. 
And it functions with a publication subscription message broker model. And as uh, Mark pointed out, that's a very good way of uh, managing your customer, uh, your, your things messages. And it, it works really easy. It's with zero provisioning. You don't have to provision anything. You just start sending messages into whatever topic you like. You can choose as many topics as you want. You don't have to set up those topics. They are created as soon as you send the first message to them or as you uh, subscribe to them. So there is no administrative overhead here. And it's secure by default. So here's a quick example on how it looks like. You have your devices to the left who send messages into the the broker part of AWS IoT. And then you can have other devices that want to listen to those messages. On the right-hand side, they just subscribe to the topics that they're interested in. And you can get really specific with those topics. You can have one topic per area. You can have a topic per class of devices. And you can narrow it down in a hierarchical manner until you get into each individual light bulb with it, so that each individual light bulb can have its own topic, or maybe LED can have their own topics here. And if you want to connect your EC2 or, or cloud-based architecture or your mobile app to the, to the system, you can also use the, the same interfaces to interact with the IoT service. The IoT service comes with a rules engine that makes it really easy to attach something to your IoT messages. So that means you can use the rules engine with some actions based on those rules to connect messages to Amazon S3, Amazon DynamoDB, Amazon Kinesis, simple notification service, Lambda, or SQS. And by extension, you can use Lambda to connect the IoT service to any other service that you like. It could be uh, another AWS service, such as Relational Database Service, Glacier, Redshift, or anything running on an EC2 instance, or any other external service. You can just forward this to maybe an external message broker that's running on one of your partner's uh, systems. So very flexible to use very easy to attach to anything else, and a great way to connect your devices to the cloud. And of course, it's very scalable, so that it really works with millions and even billions of things. So how do we tackle security here? If we want to talk over the internet, we cannot compromise on security here. We don't want people to steal your devices. So for security, we implemented certificate-based authentication, both for devices and for endpoints. So when using the IoT service, you get your own endpoint. It is secured with your certificate that you can generate or you can bring your own certificates. And then you install an X509 certificate on your device. And you can have a certificate. You can have each device have their own certificates to authenticate themselves. And then you can also shut down those certificates from the server side if your device gets compromised. So by using X509 certificates, we can secure the communication to our devices. We can authenticate those devices. We, of course, use TLS for the communication for data in transit or HTTPS with the AWS Signature 4, version 4, when you talk over HTTP. And if you want to authenticate with your mobile users, you can, of course, use Cognito and uh, our identity and access management system. And for authorization, it is all based on IAM policies that you know already. So you can attach IAM policies to devices and let your device talk to specific services on AWS and manage the flow of information and manage the security, again, on a per device level if you need to. So here is how it works. Connections are secured either through TLS or HTTPS. If you're using MQTT or HTTP plane to talk to the uh, IoT service, that's fine. You can also use the AWS API, and then you will use the this signature for authentication. Same thing, whether you're listening or whether you're talking. And then for applications, you can use the AWS API. So now that we have tackled the security question, what about unreliable connections? And this is the main reason why we built in a shadow service, a device shadows service, into the IoT system. So that means that while the device is offline, your application in the cloud can talk to the shadow as if the device was still online. And once the device comes back online, the shadow will take care of synchronizing states between the state of the shadow and the actual, de and the, the actual device here. So that means by using shadows as device proxies, you will always be able to talk to your devices, and you don't have to take care of the synchronization complexity from your application's point of view. The synchronization happens behind the scenes as soon as the device 
starts talking back to the internet. So here's the flow of how this works. Step number one, let's pretend that our device is still online, so it publishes some current state. Maybe it's one of your harvesters publishing temperature and humidity data, and everything works fine. That data gets stored in a persistent JSON data store so that we can always query what is the last known state of our device. Now let's pretend that our application requests the device's current state, but our device is offline because the harvester went into a tunnel. Well, that doesn't work, but maybe something other happened to the harvester. And uh, in this case, the application can always use a persistent data, JSON data store to get the last known state of the device. And then it can request a change of state to the device. And it doesn't matter whether the device is online or not. That change of state is recorded. And later, when the device comes back online again, it can then talk to the shadow, synchronize their state, and make sure that it always obeys to the latest state that is required of that device. And then it will publish its new state to make sure that it has understood all the changes and so that your application can verify the state change. So with a simple model, you can always pretend your device is always there, even though the connection may be unreliable in between. Now let's look at geolocation and mapping. And this is probably the, the biggest part of this talk here, because until now, this all applies to any kind of Internet of Things scenario. But if we are talking about moving things, then we are dealing with geolocation and mapping data. And to give you some use cases, you may want to track your device as it is traveling around the world. You may want to implement some geofencing logic. So if my device comes near the perimeter of my house, I want to know and I want to get a, a certain message. Or maybe you want to find nearby objects that are interesting to your device. Maybe if the fuel goes down on your car, you want to be presented with a list of fuel stations along your route that you want to, uh, what you want to visit to, to fuel up. Or maybe you want to alert other devices as you come in because you may be, you may be important or you may be, your device may be faulty or, or need help or whatever. So other things need to be notified. And this, most of the time, boils down to map matching kind of operations or routing operations on map data. So a very useful technique you can use here is called geohashing. Who knows about geohashing? Who has used geohashing before? OK, some of you know. So geohashing is a very easy technique. It works like this. You take the map of, of the world, and you split it up into two halves, left and right, or west and east. And then you split it up again into the north and the south half. And this gives you four quadrants. And those four quadrants, they could be the first digit of your geohash that will tell you where in the world, in which of these four quadrants your thing is. And then you can play the same game. You can take each quadrant and again split it up into four sub-quadrants that will yield the second digit of your geohash. And then you do this again and again and again and again. By constructing your geohash this way, we get some interesting, uh, some interesting properties for geohashes. First of all, if you compare two different geohashes, you can tell by the prefixes that are the same whether they're near to each other or not. Because if they share a significant amount of prefix, they must be near each other because the first hops through the quadrant exercise were always the same for both. So by just looking at those geohashes, you can easily tell whether they are far apart or whether they are near to each other. Of course, there are some corner cases to watch out for, but most of the time, this works pretty well, and it can be implemented very efficiently, even though the device doesn't have a lot of CPU power. So that is a very useful thing. And you can also use this with any kind of precision you want, because if you want more precision, you add more digits. And if you want to address maybe a message to a broader geographical area, you just take digits away from your geohash, and that gives you a much broader scope for whatever uh, type of data you want to look at. So let's take a look at an example that Ricardo came up with. Um, let's pretend that your car is driving down a street at some curve. This is the blue line in this graph here. And since we now have sliced and diced our map into those, those um, tiles here, the car can now compute its geohash for its current position, uh, position and then the car can subscribe to topics that are assigned to those tiles. So as the car is moving along the blue curve, it subscribes and unsubscribes to the topics associated with the tiles it touches so that the car will always get the messages that are relevant to its current position. 
This is a super simple way you just create or send messages to those topics. And you can subscribe not only to your individual tile topic, but to all of the topics that have shorter hashes as well, so that you can get all of the notifications that are targeted at either your location, your area, your country, or whatever. Very easy to implement, very powerful as a concept, leveraging the subscription and, and topic-based nature of IoT. So to make it easier for you to deal with geohashes, we developed a library called the Geo Library for Amazon DynamoDB. As you may, might have guessed, of course you can use hashes to store geodata in NoSQL data stores such as DynamoDB. And using the Geo Library for Amazon DynamoDB, we can store everything nicely in DynamoDB and the library will take care of computing those hashes, associating it with some other data that you want to store and making it easy for you to implement box and radius search queries. So you can store all the data in DynamoDB I don't know, fuel stations, coffee shops, whatever. And then you can query using latitude and longitude data that will then be mapped to geohashes so that they can be looked up from DynamoDB. So if you want to use this together with the IoT service, this is a very simple architecture you can use for this. So on the top left, we have our moving thing that sends latitude and longitude coordinates out of GPS to the IoT rules engine. And then you can implement a rule that whenever you see a lat long query, uh, it will be forwarded to a Lambda function. The Lambda function can be programmed in Java, so you can use the Geo library for DynamoDB within the Lambda function, and it will use DynamoDB as a backing store for geo data, where you can look up your geo hash and then do something useful with your result. Very easy to set up, no server involved, because you just need to set up some rules in IoT service. You set up your Lambda function, start a DynamoDB table, at the, the library will actually create its own tables, and you don't need to install anything on an EC2 instance to take advantage of this architecture. If you want to be more sophisticated, you can use Amazon RDS because we support Postgres as a database engine here, and Postgres comes with the PostGIS library, which is very powerful, and who knows the PostGIS library already? Okay, so there are lots of, of more advanced formats that you can use here, more advanced functionality here that you can take advantage of. And again, the way to use this is pretty easy. Don't worry, the slides will be on SlideShare. You, you don't have to photograph slides. It will all be on SlideShare. The, this talk is recorded. It's on YouTube. So you can, again, attach RDS through Lambda to the AWS IoT setup here. Very easy to implement, and it, it, it works really well. If you're worried about scale, because Lambda can be, pretty, pretty, can be a pretty heavy hitter. It can be like you can have like dozens of Lambda or hundreds of thousands of requests per second implemented through Lambda. You may want to implement some in-between uh, layer to cache those database connections. But yesterday I talked to the RDS guy and he said, okay, it's fine. Even for thousands of requests, that should be no problem. So you can attach, simply attach RDS to Lambda in this architecture and uh, use that for more advanced geo queries. Now, if you want to be more complex here and want to look at real map data, including routing, and relationships between objects, that sort of thing. Um, TitanDB is becoming a popular solution for that. So TitanDB is a graph-based database, which means it's a database that understands relationships between objects. Uh, many customers use this for social graphs, and it works really well in the gaming community, for instance. But you can also apply this to map data. You can import your map data into a TitanDB database, and then you can create queries that ask what is the shortest route from A to B? What are the 10 potential routes that my car can take along the road if it continues driving into this direction? So you can formulate really complex map-based queries in TitanDB. Now TitanDB is not really a database. It is actually a front end to one of the back end databases that you can combine with TitanDB. And just a few weeks ago, we released the Amazon DynamoDB storage back end for TitanDB. So that means you can take the TitanDB front end, attach it to the DynamoDB as a back end, so you don't have to, to manage a database. You can take advantage of all of the powerful functions of DynamoDB and use it behind TitanDB to, to process map queries. Architecture is slightly more complex, but I trust you will be able to set this up. You can use AWS Lambda to interface your IoT setup with TitanDB, which runs on an EC2 instance or on, on a fleet of EC2 instances. And then you use DynamoDB as the backend through the TitanDB, DynamoDB backend that we released. And that will enable you to 
do complex map, queer, map queries right from your device. So your device can send its position and its heading and ask where on the map am I, what are my possible routes to get to the next fuel station, what if there is an accident here, how can I reroute around my, my position here. And another option you can use is the Elasticsearch service. So Elasticsearch is a powerful real-time distributed open source search engine. And the power of Elasticsearch comes from, comes from its real-time nature. You can update the search engine in real time, and those updates are instantly reflected within the search engine. And it comes with a powerful query tool with Kibana, which you can use to create dashboards and uh, create the front end, the management front end for your IoT application. And Elasticsearch supports a number of geolocation features. It supports geopoints, geohashes, geoaggregations, and shapes, so that you can create powerful geo-based queries in this database where you can feed in all of your IoT positions. And maybe this is a surprise, but uh, you can really connect the Amazon Elasticsearch service really easily through Lambda to the rest of your IoT setup. You can tell I'm a lazy person. I always reuse the same architecture. But the point here is <laughs> it's easy to set up. You don't have to install anything on any instance. You just start the Amazon Elasticsearch service, write your Lambda function that implements the query, attach it to the rules engine, and you're done. Actually, the most complex part for us developing the following demo was writing Android code, writing, getting the Raspberry Pi to, to push those pixels through the LED, and that sort of thing. The rest of the architecture was not that complex, actually. So we took a look at all of these challenges and, and how to solve them. We took a look at those building blocks here. Um, we don't have a lot of time to get into very deep detail, into each of, uh, every, uh, of every aspect here. But um, you will see a lot of more detail on uh, TitanDB. We have a dedicated TitanDB session for you at reInvent. And we also have dedicated IoT sessions for all the rule engines and shadow service intricacies here. So as a summary, leverage the AWS IoT service that we launched yesterday. It really helps you be really easily connect your devices to the cloud. You don't have to go through the lot of work that, that Danny and, and Mark did um, in order to set up a message broker and make sure it's reliable and deal with the complexities of, of all the security architecture behind it. You can just use it as it is. Use device shadows to deal with unreliable connections. And then take advantage of AWS Lambda to connect with whatever other service you might have. You, wanna, you, can, you can use Lambda to connect to an existing backend. Or you might want to take a look at one of those building blocks for processing map data and geodata, either with DynamoDB, with RDS, or with the Elasticsearch service. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Ricardo. Yeah. And Ricardo has put together a wonderful demo. Yeah, thank you very that much. Hopefully uh, will work. Am I on here? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Cool. Uh, so let's talk about connected car safety. Uh, or we're going to be actually talking about uh, an application of our services that were released uh, this week in solving a real problem that we have out there. You know, the equivalent of a 787 airliner uh, worth of people die each day in car accidents. And a lot of those, about 60% of those, tend to be on pileups. Pileups that if the, the, fall, the vehicles that are on the same road, on the same route, could be aware that they're happening, they could actually uh, prevent them, right? So we're gonna be talking about a couple things here, and this is nothing new. Actually, the Department of Transportation uh, is looking at uh, several reference architectures for uh, connected vehicles. I happen to pick the spot weather warning system. This is something that you can actually look up on the URL that's provided here. It's one of 60 applications. And it's a very interesting one because it deals with the problem of getting da uh, data from the vehicle data bus and passing it through the on some onboard equipment over to nearby infrastructure or directly using a, a 3G network, for example, to the traffic information center. The Traffic Information Center makes the decision of whether to send uh, uh, warnings or speeds to the change, uh, uh, changes to the speed limit, for example, down to dynamic message signs uh, or to connected vehicles themselves. So this is actually one of 60 applications out there, and I really encourage you to take a look at this and, and use our services to try to solve some of these. Um, now, of course, there's always the thing, right? The, what is actually running on the device? Uh, in this case, I chose a smart device link capable vehicle uh, to implement what I'm showing you. The reason why I chose that is, is, is a very safe way to get vehicle data 
and send messages back to the driver. The last thing we want to do is distract the driver when he's actually doing, you know, driving a vehicle, a football field per second, right, in treacherous situations. So we need to find a way to interact with the driver using the existing HMI, or human and machine interfaces that are in a vehicle. Things like the, the text-to-speech capabilities, uh, the, the steering wheel buttons, and the displays that are there. So I chose the smart device link uh, platform, and it's being widely adopted by two very large OEMs. Uh, so I encourage you to take a look at that open source uh, uh, project and develop your apps uh, to play nicely with it. So I just chose the following targeted implementation for the spot weather warning uh, impact system. Uh, we have, uh, so if you imagine the, um, uh, where's my cursor here? Can you guys see it? Okay, can't, no problem. But if you imagine the vehicle that are in, going in front, uh, or that are detecting the situation, being on the left side, and the vehicles that care about the situation or the dynamic message signs that need to be, be notified if there is a problem, being on the opposite side. And of course, AWS in between, right? So what we're doing at the end of the day is we're reporting state and we're updating state, right? So the, fall, the lead vehicles are reporting their current position and the driving dynamics of the vehicle, how hard the, the brake is being pressed, what the steering wheel angle is. And hopefully in the future, OEMs will start to open up more data. So I'd love to get a hold, for example, of ABS actuations, because that would be the, the, the very nice piece of information that I know if I can detect, to detect whether the road is slippery or not. But we're getting speed, we're getting heading, and that's sufficient enough for this demo. We're updating the vehicle state. And, and we have our AWS IoT service that is listening for the, those updates and calculating very t uh, whether or not those updates require a warning. Some of them are fine. Some of them are really, really important to notify the nearby, uh, the following vehicles. And if the, it does require a notification, we're going to update the desired state of the following vehicles to be that of warning. In other words, show something on the HMI. We're gonna update the desired state of the dynamic message signs to show a specific message. So that's what we're doing here. We're just getting reported state and setting desired state of the, of the vehicles, right? Uh, that's, no, no wanna go there. Enough talk, let's do something. So let's, let's go for a drive. Now, I, I couldn't get three cars on stage. I couldn't uh, find connected vehicles on, uh, to control them remotely. So uh, I decided to use emulators, right? So um, hopefully they work. Uh, let's, first of all, check out what's in the car. That's important, right? Uh, what do I have in the vehicle? Actually, very little, right? I have a, assuming I have a SmartLink capable vehicle, like a Ford um, type, uh, Sync unit, for example, uh, I have a, developed a, an application that once paired with Bluetooth, uh, so here's my application, it's running in an Android emulator. Once it pairs with Bluetooth, it will show up automatically on the head unit, and if I say, okay, it connects over, you see the application will change, you'll go into a lock screen once I start driving, because that's the safe thing to do, and now I no longer need to worry about the cell phone. This is strictly a background application. I'm not fumbling with my phone, I don't need to look at it, I just gotta drive. So, let's drive, okay? Here's what we're gonna do. I'm going to, first of all, connect my vehicle over, so it starts sending messages. And you guys will see in the Kibana uh, dashboard, Elasticsearch dashboard here, they will start populating as I start to drive the vehicle around. I'm going to start the first vehicle uh, and the second vehicle really close to each other. These are the types of uh, drivers that like to follow each other really closely, right? I'm, I'm one of them. And let's take a look at what's going on here. So the vehicle data is being passed from the head unit over to my mobile app. And my mobile app is connected over to AWS IoT. And we're sending that information over to a rules engine. And the rules engine is piping the, the events over to Kinesis. It's also piping the events over to SQS. Uh, Kinesis is being used, uh, is being uh, consumed, the Kinesis events are being consumed by uh, a very simple Lambda function that pipes the data into Elasticsearch. So you can see here the Elasticsearch uh, dashboard that, um, now these guys are moving along, so you see here, let me give a little more real estate. You see here that in real time, Elasticsearch is populating that information with uh, some geo information that the vehicles are passing, things like average speed, the histogram of speeds, that's all there, okay? Uh, you actually have a lot of data that we, are, we made available uh, in, this, in, in this example. 
You see here the, you know, the various pieces of information that the, it, it's directly available to you from the head unit, and we're just passing that down over to Kinesis and showing and indexing that over into Kibana. So it's, it's pretty cool. Um, but uh, because we have multiple cars, it's also useful to figure out where they're at uh, with relationship to each other, right? So we have a very simple um, static website here that's pulling information off of SQS, and it's uh, mapping where the vehicles are. So you see that the cars are uh, moving along. Let me start my other one. Okay, so now we should have three vehicles traveling down Mass Pike, um, road by Boston there. So what we're gonna do is, I'm actually going to slow down this vehicle a little bit because I want him to be really close uh, to the, uh, the person that's following him. And what I'm gonna do is actually evoke what I'm calling a safety event here. Now the emulator is limited to what it can simulate. I can't not simulate, for example, an airbag deployment. But I can throw the car in park in the middle of the, while doing 140 miles an hour in a highway. <laughs> so I'm gonna do that, and that's my safety event. That is being sent over to the rules engine. It's calculating, oh, this is not natural. Let's now alert, uh, the, the, the send out a message that nearby vehicles will pick up. Uh, so you saw here that this picked it up. And once that following vehicle gets within the range uh, of, the, of the accident, in this case I'm using a seven, a six digit hash, so it's about 600 meters, uh, it will be notified uh, that the event actually happened, right? And that notification is gonna come through the HMI in form of text-to-speech, which is, uh, you won't be able to hear here today. Uh, but, um, and it, the driver who hopefully is also given the option to send feedback about the notification. And that feedback can be captured and into a machine learning model that we can eventually train and give better, more targeted notifications. So getting close to the accident here, hopefully um, the um, things will work out fine here. So we are sending that event. And as that vehicle approaches the, the accident area, uh, he will be notified. There is the first one. He already reached it, has it detected. And if we were actually on, a, on the vehicle, you'd hear has it detected. Pretty cool. And let me go a little faster here so you guys can see what's going on. Is anything flashing here? Oh, this is our dynamic message sign, by the way. As soon as the crash happened, it probably flashed, did it? I, I didn't catch. So you will subscribe to the overall topic of all of Mass Pike. Uh, and as soon as there was the first event, uh, we fired the dynamic message sign. And, um, and okay, there's the third vehicle, we just approached the area. And as the vehicles move away from the area, the alarm is no longer an issue. So I really wanna encourage you, we have the tools in place. We can build this tomorrow, guys, we really can. The Ford vehicles are now shipping with the sync head unit. Uh, and uh, we have several reference architectures out there. Uh, an awesome service that you can that you can use that's reliable, that's re real time. Let's start solving this issue about connected vehicles and safety. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Ricardo. And uh, thanks to all the people who worked in the background to set up this demo. We have uh, Sanjoy who built the Android app and Jan who built the the map stuff, so really, really cool stuff here. So we hope that this gives you a, a lot of ideas on what you can do with your own Internet of Things setup. And please check out some of the other IoT deep dive talks. Actually, it's, the best idea here is to just stay in this room, because the next talk in this room is going to be about IoT data and analytics, which helps you understand what can I do with all the data that I get from my devices? How can I analyze them? What kind of use cases are there? And that talk is, being, is going to be given by my colleague Michael from the same team here. But again, other nice talks here. Again, there's also a dedicated talk on TitanDB. Uh, and uh, make sure you check out these talks. So with that, thank you very much for coming here. We hope it was worthwhile, and we hope you liked it. Thank you. Thank you.